All right, so the recorder is started. I just double check the visual is good, the sound is good. So we're gonna get started because we really cannot afford to lose time. Uh, the pace of the class is actually not gonna wind down. We're gonna pick up. So that means you know if anyone has any questions, you know, ask it in class or ask it during the office hour, which is right after this class. Um, because any type of you know, uh, non-understanding of the material is not going to uh, do well you know, in the future, the last, the next uh, few weeks of this class. All right, so let me go to the announcements first, uh, just to make sure that people are aware of a few things. <clears throat> first of all, uh, exam two is going to be scheduled not on this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. So that will be November 8th. It will be arranged very similarly in terms of uh, open book, open notes, you know, and all on paper, like exam one. Okay, so you make sure that you bring your notes. It is still open book and open notes, no electronics. So anything that you want to bring with you, you might want to start collecting those things now, okay, because you don't want to push all the way until next Tuesday to try to print out everything that you want, that you need, that you think you need. So now would be a good time to start. So that's exam two. Um, I'm also including a practice exam, so to speak. This is the actual exam from um, last semester. So you can print it out, you can just open it up as a PDF and just kind of ponder as you study to see how you can answer those questions. Um, obviously, you know, I do not ask the same kind of questions in at least you know, two consecutive exams, um, may not even in the same format, but the scope will still be the same. The scope is going to be everything from floating point number representation all the way through today's lecture. So that would be the scope of the exam. Um, <clears throat> if anyone needs a DSPS accommodations, you know, they need about a week to schedule the accommodations. So you know, today would be, or tomorrow at the latest, would be a good time to go to the DSPS department to arrange for accommodations. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. It just means that it really does not apply to you in this case. All right, so with all that said, there's one more, okay? I hate to kind of spill out your tiny little announcements, but this is the last one. Um, I basically converted the processor, the ALU, and also the register bank into their own PDF files. Um, you can do whatever you want, okay? You can ignore this entirely, okay? That's fine with me. You can download these, put it on your tablet, so as you try to understand the execution of instructions, you can just make copies of these things, so this way you can highlight on your own document, you know, how the pathways are formulated and stuff like that. That's another way to do it. You can also annotate, you know, add your own numbers on the tunnels and then try to figure out what is going on. So anyway, it's just resources available to you, available to you. Uh, not only for studying purposes, you can also you know, print these out and bring it to exam two. Okay, remember, anything that is on paper is okay. So that includes everything that I gave you in this class. So that's about all the uh, announcements you know, regarding um, exam two. <clears throat> uh, one thing that you, okay, it's a little bit late in the semester to mention this, but you might want to kind of Keep in mind, I'm putting the uh, timestamp up here so it's recorded. Um, one thing that you might want to kind of keep in mind is the calendar. If you go all the way down here, because I have zoomed in already, the screen has limited resolution. Um, there should be a calendar. Oh, I see why it's not doing that because I have to maximize the screen. Now it shows it at the bottom. Give me a second here to scroll all the way down. All right, so if you go to the bottom of any um, canvas your shell and you go to view calendar, you will see the calendar. But you can also do something a little bit better. Okay, some of you may know this already, but some of you may not know this. <clears throat> so I'm going to show I'm going to show you how to do it. Yep. Did you start the recorder? Yes, the recorder is on and the visual and the audio are both here. Good. Thank you. Thank you for checking. So when you go to the calendar, you can go to calendar feed, okay? So if you click on calendar feed, it'll give you a URL. So with, it, you, with this URL, you can basically add your Canvas calendar 
to your mobile device. Uh, whether it's iOS or Android, you know, the method is a little bit different, but it works on both operating systems. The nice thing of doing this is all your homework assignments, all the exam schedules, everything that is on Canvas will show up on your mobile device, on the calendar on, on your mobile device. Um, I do that personally. So this way, you know, when I look at my schedule, if I look ahead, you know, about a week or so, you know, each day, I go like, oh, okay, I got this homework through grade, this exam, and so on and so forth. I find it to be really, really helpful, okay? So um, once again, you know, this is a, an available resource to you. Whether you want to use it or not is entirely up to you. All right, so with all, that, uh, you know, with all that said and done, it is time to get into the content of today's class. <clears throat> so what we are doing in today's class, let me go to the drive, okay? So we go to the share drive. You know, I'm probably picking up the wrong window for this class because you know, the opco table is not here, the assembler is not here, but that's okay. You know, we can always go find it in the process as a folder. And then we go to opcode table first. All right, so we got the opcode table. Now remember, the opcode table is one of the things that you can also print and bring with you to the exam. Okay, obviously it depends on whether you think it's going to be useful or not. If you think it's not going to be useful, don't bring it. But on the other hand, if you think this is going to be useful, print it out and bring it with you. Um, so what we are going to talk about today are two instructions or two you know, families of instruction. One is JMPI, not JMP. Okay, so let's look for JMPI, which is out here. So this is the first instruction that we're going to talk about. I will trace through the execution of the instruction so that we know exactly how the process will get the job done. So when you look at the, the third column of column C, which is the RTL description, the register transfer language description of the instruction, it looks a little bit strange because it is basically saying whatever the program counter is pointing to, dereference it, and then use the content in RAM that the program counter points to to update the program counter itself. Okay? So, okay, what is the significance of, significance of this instruction? The first thing you need to remember or to understand or to recall is what is the program counter? What does it do? What is the one job of the program counter? So I'm going to start with asking that question because you, the answer to that question will help you in today's lab as well. So I'm going to ask, start with that question. You guys have the benefit of having the Tuesday class, the Tuesday Thursday class ahead of you. So when I you know, answer those questions you know, in the Tuesday Thursday class during the lab, I now know, oh, okay, this may be important. So can someone tell me what is the significance or what is the purpose of the program counter in the processor? <coughs> and if you cannot remember what it is, we'll go to Logisim. So you can take a quick look. This, oh, where is it? Right here, okay, down here a little bit. This is the program counter. What is the purpose of the program counter? It is one of the first registers that we talked about when we talked about how instructions execute in the processor. Yep. Uh, to store the uh, address of RAM and where we're supposed to be the next upcode. Excellent. Okay, that is the right answer. The program counter is a pointer into RAM so that we know where to get or where to fetch the next opcode, okay? So that is an excellent answer. So by changing the program counter directly, we are altering the path of execution. We can basically go, oh, continue execution all the way over there. Why? I don't know, but the instruction is telling me to continue ex execution over there, okay? So what we'll do is we are gonna hand assemble a program you know, that is not complicated at all in order to illustrate how the uh, JMPI instruction operates. So this is the JMPI instruction. The opcode in binary is 0100 and then four zeros. So that means it's a four zero in hexadecimal. And it because it has an immediate operand, it also means that it needs a second byte 
to specify the immediate constant itself, which is going to be whatever we put into the program counter itself in order to change the path of execution. So what we'll do is we are switching to Logisim, and then we are just going to put in the program by hand assembling the whole thing. So the first one is the opcode of the JMPI instruction itself. The second byte is going to tell us where do we want to go to continue execution. So this time, I'm going to make it kind of fun, okay? We're going to say, go all the way to the end of RAM to continue execution. Ignore everything from this point on and go all the way to the end. Now, I cannot really change the byte at the end of RAM by you know, poking you know, in this tool here. So I have to go back to logo to edit content and then use the Logisim editor in order to go all the way to the end of RAM. This entire row starts with F0. So FF is going to be the very last byte on the very last row when we look at the content of RAM. So right here, we put a halt instruction because we are jumping all the way to the end of RAM and then execute the halt instruction. I don't think I'm going to, well, okay, we can actually go there, okay, but that's fine. So now I'm done with uh, you know, hand editing the RAM content, and we're going to start executing the instruction. Do we have any questions before we get started with this particular strange program? You want to see any questions? Okay, so we're going to get <clears throat> started with this program. So at this point of time, I will not get into the details of how to do the fetch and also the decode cycle. We'll just say four control T's, okay? Your four control T's will get to the execute portion of the instruction. So one, two, three, four, okay? And you can see how the microcode pointer is the same as the instruction register with an extra zero padded on the right-hand side. That's basically what decode does on this particular processor. And you can also see that in ROM, <clears throat> we are now you know, having the content of 1FD, 1F8006, okay, which basically spews out 26 bits you know, as its output, the D port. And now we want to find out what is going on, okay, when we execute this, this instruction, what is what is what is it doing? Personally, I like to look at RAM first. Because if, if RAM is in use, I can automatically ask three additional questions, which is great, okay? Because if you look at the registers, you know, they're a little bit more scattered. But looking at RAM, you know, I, I, I just personally like to do that first. So with, with the PDF that I sent you, you can now, you know, basically just highlight, okay, you know, all the important components, you know, RAM, the ALU, the register bank and also the program counter and the instruction register. Those, those are the only five really important components. The rest are really only there to support these five major components. So if we look at RAM, you know, we do the usual analysis, which I'm not going to describe in detail anymore because I've done that many times already. We are reading from RAM, so we want to find out how you know, the A port is determined. So we track the A port. We, it is coming out of the multiplexer. The selected bit is a one, which means we track down input one, which is coming out of the program counter. So now we know the program counter is connected to the A port of RAM. That <clears throat> is also why you know PC and the asterisk operator is in the description of the instruction, because we are using the program counter as a pointer into RAM. Okay, so now the next question is, what are we doing with the content that the program counter is pointing to? So we, when we go back to Logisim, then we track down the D port this time, and we find we try to find out who is updating depending on you know, the node that is now selected. The instruction register, well, it is connected, but it's not paying attention because the enable is dark green, it is not enabled. Uh, we go through the usual things, okay? You know, it does go into the in, uh, the register bank, but the the register bank has R I E N, which is register input enable, also being dark green, which means none of the four registers in the register bank is being updated. Then we look at the program counter. The program counter does have program and uh, program counter enabled being a light green, so we know the program counter is going to be updated. Now, we already know what it's going to do because of the description, the RTL description, column C of the opcode table. 
But what we're going to do is to really just kind of track it down quickly. Uh, we can see how the D part of the program counter is coming out of the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a 1 as the select, so that means we have to track down input 1 to this multiplexer. With the other multiplexer, it also has an input of a select input of 1, which means we track down this wire, which goes all the way to the data port. In other words, we have just confirmed that we are using the content at the location of RAM that PC, the program counter, is pointing to itself to update the program counter. All right? <clears throat> so at this point in time, if you're saying, oh, okay, this is kind of cool, but also at the same time kind of boring, I could have done it myself, congratulations, okay? That is great, okay? Because, you know, you really should be able to do all of this stuff by yourself now, okay? I'm just, you know, helping to guide you know you to kind of understand how the processor works so when I do a control T <clears throat> the program counter will in fact update to the content at location guess what location FF with a, a value of FF oh let me take it back it's going to update to the content at location 0 1 which has a value of FF so the program counter will update to FF when I type control T so we'll observe that Control T right there. So you can see how the program counter just updated to a value of FF. So that means in the next fetch phase of the execute execution cycle, the program counter will tell the op will tell the processor to go to location FF in RAM to get the next opcode, just as you know the description that we talked about earlier. Is that okay? So the JMPI instruction is really a go-to statement, so to speak, in C and C++ and all, app, uh, all programming languages. It is just a way to alter the execution path unconditionally. In other words, it will always do this. So we're going to finish this up you know, with um, just you know, going to location FF. Okay? So I do another control T, which increments <coughs> the microcode pointer to location 401 which is going to be a two followed by all the zeros. And what that will do is to reset the micro code pointer back to zero, 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 which starts the next deal fetch phase of the next instruction execution, like so, okay? But the most important part here is in this particular fetch phase, we know that we are going to go to location FF to get the next opcode because the program counter says so. So that's basically you know, how the JMPI instruction works. It is called the unconditional branch instruction, also called the jump instruction. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions regarding this you know, kind of rather short demonstration. No questions? Okay, no questions that I see. All right, so next we're going to talk about conditional branch instructions. <clears throat> The only thing inside the processor that will help us implement loops, conditional statements, and stuff like that are these five instructions. Okay, so these five instructions, JLI, JOI, JSI, JCI, and JZI, they are named after the flag that they depend on to determine whether to branch or not. So when you look at the when you look at column D, which is an English description of the opcode itself or the instruction itself, they say jump if and only if the L flag, well, if the L flag is what? It's true, okay? I don't have to say when the L flag is true because L flag, the L flag is a Boolean value. So when I say if and only if L, it really implies that if and only if L is true, okay? If it is less than. Or... In the next one, jump if and only if there's an overflow. Jump if and only if the result of an operation is signed, is a has a signed bit of one. Jump if and only if the carry bit, which is also the borrow bit, is a one. And then jump if and only if the Z flag is a one. <clears throat> and if you look at column C, which is the RTL description, the register transfer language description, it looks a little bit cryptic, but also a little bit like the one that we saw earlier. Because when you look at it, it goes like PC is going to be updated. Okay, but how is it going to be updated? It depends on the L, O, S, C, and Z flag. In other words, 
We're going to take a look at those flags that we just mentioned earlier. If it is true, then we, it is just like the JM, JMPI instruction. We're going to update the program counter based on where the program counter is pointing to in RAM itself, just like the JMPI instruction. But what if the flag is not true? What if the flag is a zero? Then we're just going to go like, oh, just skip this location and get to the next location. In other words, just pretend that there's no JM, there's no branch instruction. We're just going to the next instruction and not carry out the branch, not carrying out the jump uh, operation. Okay, so here comes the question. It's like, where are those flags coming from? And you know, what, are, what, is the, in, what is the processor actually doing when we execute these instructions? Well, this is a whole family. You know, these five instructions are closely related. So the first thing we're gonna do is just to pick one of them, just to find out you know, how the processor is configured in order to execute the instruction. So I'm just gonna pick um, JSI in this case, okay? So we're gonna pick JSI, <clears throat> which is row 12, okay, right there. And it has an opcode of 43, because 0100 is a four, 0011 is a three, so we have four three here. Okay, so this is another thing you know, that I want to remind people is if you are not memorizing the um, hexadecimal to binary lookup table, some of you can probably remember it by now, okay? But if you're saying, well, I can remember most of it, but I really do not trust my you know, memory, that's okay. Bring that map with you, bring that table. On one column, you have the hexadecimal digits. On the other one, you have the four-bit patterns. You know, just bring that with you. Put it on your own notes, okay? You, or just go to the internet, find a picture that is really nice or well done. You know, crop it, put it into your notes before you print it out, okay? <clears throat> so 403 is what we're looking at here. So now we go back to Logisim. And I'm just going to do the lazy thing and not to, to reload the entire thing. Instead, I will do a control R to reset the processor. And then we go to RAM, change this location to a 4.3. And if the sign flag is a 1, we are going to go to, um, yeah, we'll do the two things here separately. So we'll go to location 0C, okay? Otherwise, we have this halt instruction here. And at location 0C, we just put another halt instruction here. So this is now a conditional branch, which is basically saying if, if the S flag is a 1, then we continue execution at 0C, and then we halt over there. On the other hand, if the sign flag is a 0, then we're just going to halt you know, at the next halt instruction. So there are two halt instructions here. Which one we go to depends on the sign flag itself. Do we have any questions at this point about you know, how the program is constructed? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so now we go to the actual you know, execution phase of the instruction. And as usual, at this point of this class, I'm just gonna fast track through one, two, three, four, and here we go, okay? So when you look at this picture here, I'm just gonna do it real quick. You can see that we saw we will see the same pattern as what we saw earlier. RAM is being used, it is being read. The uh, PC, you know, through this particular multiplexer, is controlling the A port here. The data port is all is connected all the way back to the program counter, or not, right? Because you can see that this time PC mux is a zero, which means we're only incrementing the program counter. But there's one crucial thing that I have not shown you or to explain. Where is, this, where is the S flag? Because the whole thing depends on the S flag. So where is the S flag? But there's also another related question, which is, what is PC MUX? PC MUX looks like one of those other tunnels that may be coming directly from the ROM, from the depot of ROM, but that is actually not true, okay? So the first thing we do is to track down what is PC MUX? Where is it coming from? And how does it get the job done in this case? So we highlight PC MUX, so all the nodes you know, related to PC MUX will be highlighted. And then we find the PC MUX is all the way up here. It is the output of this particular multiplexer. 
So every time you can see that, okay, the output of this multiplexer is of interest to us, what is going to be your next question to ask? What is, it what, what is it connected to? And because it's a multiplexer, so when you see that you're interested in the output of a multiplexer, what do you look at next? The select. The select. Very good. Okay. So now we look at the select of the multiplexer that has the output that we are interested in, which is PC Mux Mux. The name PC Mux Mux is kind of like a funny thing that I did because it is a multiplexer to a multiplexer. The output of this multiplexer is the select of another multiplexer. So it's basically a multiplexer of a multiplexer. So when we poke this wire, we see it is a zero, one, zero. What does that mean? It means input two is connected to the output of this multiplexer. So now we look at the input of this multiplexer and we just count. This is uh, input zero, this is input one, and this is input two. <laughs> So that means the multiplexer is currently configured to look at bit two, okay, of its input and connect it to the output, which is PC MUX, which eventually specify how we are going to update the program counter. So are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So now we say, where is that coming from? So we, we track down this um, splitter. The splitter goes to this wire, and this wire co you know, comes out of the, uh, it goes into the input of flex in of the ALU, and it is um, also just connected to the multiplexer through the splitter. We go like, hmm, okay, so this is the output of a flags register, which we seldom mention until up to this point. So the next thing is, well, if we just want to play with this instruction, it's easy, okay? So all we have to do is to say, okay, so apparently bit two of this flex register is now determining PC mux mux, uh, is determining PC mux. So we can now poke a value or you know, inject a value into the flex register. So the bit two is going to be a one. So because it is a five bit register, because right here we know it's a five bit register. So in order for bit two to be a one, I think we need to say zero four in this case. Okay, because bit zero is a one, bit one is a two, bit two is a four. Okay, and four that is in decimal and also in hexadecimal. So when I put, uh, when I say zero, four in the flex register, you can see that the PC mux is now a light green, which means if I go all the way back to the program counter, we can now see that the program counter the, the multiplexer that feeds the program counter D port is now selecting input one, and now this particular select is also a one, which means now we are looking at the data out, the data port output of the RAM. So we can now kind of see, oh, so that's how we can do conditional stuff, okay? Depending on bit two of the flex register, we can change PC mux. And the way PC mux changes would also determine which way we look from the from the perspective of this multiplexer, as well as from you know, which uh, input from the perspective of, of this multiplexer, and then together these two multiplexers will help to determine how we are going to update the program counter. So uh, is that okay? So we answered one of the few questions that you might have on your mind. This question being the one that says, how can it be conditional? How can we look at one thing, and if it is a zero, this is how we update the program counter, uh, or if it is a one, then we are, this is how the way we update the program counter. It is through the use of multiplexers, because a multiplexer is a switch. So by using that switch, we can now say, hmm, if that thing is a one, go this route. If that thing is a zero, go the other route. Is that okay? And then the whole thing has to do with PC mux mux, which specifies um, which bit do we want to look at to determine how the program counter is going to be updated. So in this case, we just so happen to look at bit two of the flags register. Are we doing okay so far tracking down the how the things are connected? Is that good so far? Okay. So then the next question is, how do we determine 
the bits inside the flags register? That becomes the next question, okay? <clears throat> so we look at the flags register, we focus on the flags register now, and then we ask, how, does you, how do you get your value updated? So that means we have to track down the D port of the flags register. We can see that it, oh, this is not the D port, this is the D port, okay. So yes, it is erroneous now. It reports that some of the bits are not determined. It is okay, okay? That's actually not a problem here. But we can also see the only thing that can update the content or the value of the flex register is, what does it connect to? This one does not even connect to, to any multiplexer. There's no switches whatsoever. It just go, co connects directly to, what is the name of the component that it connects to? The ALU, very good, okay. So now, we trace it down to the ALU. You can kind of see that you know, this, these exercises, it's kind of like you know when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I got a subscription of these magazines for children, and you know, on every single one, okay, you know, every single issue has a maze that, you, that says, okay, this is where the cat is, and this is where the, the mouse is, you know, how would the cat catch the mouse? So you have to kind of track down through the maze and find the path, you know, to the mouse or, you know, the mouse versus the cheese, you know, you get the idea. We're doing the same thing here, except this is a multi-level maze, okay? And, you know, the, how, the, uh, how the path, you know, connect also depends on the values of the tunnels. But nonetheless, this is just a maze, okay? We know how to read this maze by now. So what we do is we look into the ALU and then we ask, what is inside the ALU? How does it, you know, you know, uh, make connections to flags out? Okay, so because flags out, which is this connection here, is what we use to update the flags register. So we right click on this, we go to view ALU, and of course it has a bunch of output ports, okay, and we are not really quite sure which one is which one. So when we are not really sure which one is which one, what we do is we go to the appearance mode of the view of the ALU. We go like, okay, flex out, that's the one that we're interested in. We click on it, and then there's a PIP, a picture in picture, that will show us you know, which one, you know, which output port we should be looking at. It is the one all the way to the right hand side and all the way to the bottom. That, but that's where we start our trace inside the ALU, okay? So we switch back to the actual circuit detail. This is the port that eventually connects to the D port of the flags register. So this is where, you know, if you're doing this by yourself, okay, this is where you're gonna go like, okay, you have a bunch of tunnels connected to the splitter that eventually feed into this port here. So you probably want to go like, okay, I'm gonna track down those, those things one at a time. So you might need to jot down some notes. It's like, I'm going to start with the C flag, okay? The C out in the tunnel, which determines bit zero. Z out determines bit one. S out determines bit two. O out determines bit three. And then this thing determines the bit four. So you need to track them down one by one, okay? So what we're going to do is to go like, hmm. Okay, that may not be easy to do without another instruction to kind of help us out with this whole thing. So what we'll do is we're going to talk about another opcode for now, okay? But before I switch to the other opcode, do we have any questions about the conditional nature and mechanism of the conditional branch instructions? How does it have the ability to go like, Hey, if this is a one, we're going to go over there. But if this is a zero, we are just going to pretend that we are not branching and we're just going to go to whatever is next to the conditional branch instruction. Do we understand the basic mechanism of how a single bit inside the flex register is going to help us determine how the program counter is going to update? Do we have any questions about that particular mechanism? Not see any questions, okay? So there are times, okay, you know, I can understand you know, why some people may not want to ask questions in class, but when you do have questions and you're not fully understanding something, you probably want to jot it down, 
Okay, you know, just kind of write down in your own notes. You go like, I need to follow up on this one because I'm not fully understanding it. Okay, so you can spend some time on your own to try to understand it. But if you cannot figure it out, you can always come to my office hour. But then you at least you remember, okay, what question you have, okay, so that you can go back. You know, when you're reviewing your notes, you go like, oh right, you know, I'm not quite understanding that mechanism. Let me think about that for a little bit, okay. Spend half an hour, maybe even 45 minutes on it, okay? And you go like, okay, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I really try my best. I still don't know what's going on. So you come to me, okay, with that question, and then we'll try to figure out all of this stuff here in my office or in class if there are enough people asking the same question. But the point is you have to jot it down, okay, because otherwise you won't remember that you have a question about a particular topic that we are talking about. That's one of the purposes of you know, taking notes in the class, is to remember your own questions as I go over the material. All right, okay, so let's move on and talk about the compare instruction. So we're gonna switch to the compare instruction and it is CMP, not CPR. So the CMP instruction is, okay, I cannot remember where I put it, it is right here. So this is the compare instruction, which is kind of weird, okay? Because it, it resembles the subtract instruction. We can see x minus y is here, x minus y is also here. There's only one difference, which is really significant. What are we doing with the difference? With subtraction, the difference is being used to update whatever register x is. So that means it's gonna change one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D, when you're using the sub instruction. But when you're using the CMP or the compare instruction, we perform the entire motion of doing the subtraction and go like, we, are, we don't care about the difference, just toss it away. We go like, why would we do that? Okay, you know, because what is the whole purpose of doing the subtraction and not keeping the difference, not using the difference to update anything? So, what we'll do is we're going to try out this instruction now, okay? So this is a 1110, which is an E, and then we just have to determine which two registers we want to use, you know, to compare. Um, I'm just going to pick, you know, um, register B for XX, so XX is going to be 0, 1, and register C for Y, which is 1, 0. So the, the least significant four bits would be 0, 1, 1, 0, which is a 6. So that means we have E6 as an opcode. So I switch back to my logic screen here, do a control R, reset the entire processor, put in the opcode that we just figured out, which is E6, okay, and then followed by a 0, 1 here. So this is a really simple program. All it does is to go through the motion of subtracting register C from the value of register B but do not keep the result, toss away the result, okay? So we want to, you want to try to figure out what is the whole point of this opcode then? Yeah, we do the subtraction, but we are not keeping the difference. <clears throat> All right, and for this particular instruction, it probably makes more sense you know, if we do not make your register B and C both zeros, just so that we can play with the flags, right? So we go like, eh, okay, so we can go like one is going to be FF and the other one is going to be zero, 01. So we are subtracting zero, 01 from FF. And all of you can tell right away, oh, the answer is going to be FE. Yep, it is FE. The question is, but we are not using FE, okay? It's being tossed away. So what else is going on inside the ALU? And how does that have anything to do with the flags register, okay? So you can see that, you know, I would, when I explain something, I intentionally leave behind, you know, from the perspective of C++ programming, dangling pointers. Pointers that do not seem to be pointing anywhere, they're, they're uninitialized. I intentionally leave behind these loose ends, okay? You know, if you, you watch any type of your crime show, you know, this is, these are loose ends or your dangling pointers because I want you to kind of question that in your own mind. It's like, okay, we, we left behind the whole question of what is being used to update the flags register, and now we talk about an instruction 
that does not store the difference after its subtraction. How are those things connected? So is that okay? All right. So I am really spelling out you know the whole um, structure of the lecture at this point. At a four-year university, those professors are not likely to spell that out. Okay, they, they are they're going to leave behind crumbs so they can follow. Okay, but they're not going to say, "Look at that! That's a piece of crumb, and you're supposed to be following that." They're not going to tell you that. Okay, so you have to kind of train yourself to understand. You know the the indicators in a lecture go like, "Oh, okay." I think the professor just just drop a crumb on the on the ground, um, and I'm gonna pick it up. Okay, I'm gonna take note, pick that up, and go like, hmm. I wonder where this is leading. Okay, this is a curious thing. Okay, you know, I don't know what it is leading. You just you know jot down some notes. Okay. All right. So getting back to our instruction here. So we go back to main, and then we go all the way to the execute phase of the instruction. So once again, just four clicks, you know, four control T's. One, two, three, four. Okay, so now the processor is configured to execute the CMP or the compare instruction. So we look at all the RAM, all the important components here. Um, this one is not being used because you know, the select bit is a dark green. It's not we're using we're not using RAM. Well, that automatically cut off the other three follow-up questions. Are we reading? Who's controlling the A port? Who's doing? Who's connected to the B port? None of those questions is relevant now. Okay, that's easy. We look at the other registers that are also kind of important. We look at the PC not being updated. We look at the instruction register not being updated. We look at the flags register. Ah, this one is getting updated because you know the enable to the flags register right here is a bright green. So like, okay. We might need to track this one down, okay? So when the flex register is getting updated, it's coming from the flex out reg uh, the flex out port of the ALU. So now we want to look into the ALU itself, okay? So I am tracking everything from the perspective of the flex out register, which is right here. So now we have to take notes, okay? Now I know I I can remember which one I have explained and which one I have not explained. But when you are doing this yourself, you might need to kind of jot down some notes and go like, okay, I need to figure out bit zero, one, two, three, and four. But right now, I'm just going to work with bit zero, and then I work with bit one and so on, so that you don't forget that you have the other bits that you have to track. Okay, so we track down bit zero first. So bit zero is connected to a tunnel called C out. Okay, you go like, okay, where is that coming from? Ah, it's right here. C out is coming out of this you know, multiplexer here. So we have already talked about you know, when you are interested in the output of a, of a multiplexer, the next thing you need to look at is the select, okay? Which input connects to the output? And that would be the gray dot, okay? The, the wire right below the gray dot here. You can just kind of poke it and see that it is zero, zero, 001. But you also might want to track down who is determining that the select is 001? So you track down this wire and you find that, oh, it's coming from op cell, okay, or operation select, okay? And operation select is its own port, and you can go to the appearance mode and find out which one is, con is connected to that, and that should be this one here, okay? And you can sort of see, okay, I know it's hard for you guys to see, but you can see that, you know, the port that we just looked at from the inside of the ALU is the one that we are cooking right now on the appearance part of the same component. Okay, that's kind of important. Then you go to main and you look at the same port from main and you ask, so who is determining that? It is an, a tunnel that is called ALUOP or arithmetic and logic unit operation and that comes straight out of the ROM. Okay, in other words, the 26 bits coming out of the D port of ROM, three of those is telling the ALU that, oh, this is the operation that I want you to perform right now. All right? Okay. So what else? Okay, what else do we have to track down? Well, we, are, we were looking at C out, okay? So now that we know the uh, select is a zero, zero, 001, that means you know, this input eventually becomes the C out. 
So now what do we do? We track that one down, okay? We track down, so who is the C tunnel, okay? Who specifies, you know, what output goes to the C, the B tunnel? So B tunnel is going up here, and it is one of the output of the subtractor, okay? This is the subtractor. You can click on it, and let me see. Yeah, nope, nope, not, not unless I use the selection tool. You can click on it, and it tells you it is a subtractor. So when you know that it is a, a subtractor, uh, you can look up the references, you know, using the help menu and find out which port is which port. But I can already tell you what it is. This is basically the same thing as what we call T8 in a subtractor, in a binary subtractor. So T8 is the one extra borrow bit, you know, coming out of a subtractor that tells you about whether the entire operation is a borrow or not. Okay, that is T8 in our terminology. Okay. But the most important thing is it is the output of a subtractor. You might want to know what are we subtracting then? So now we track down the two things that we are subtracting. This is the min one, this is the subtrahend. So you, when you track these two down, you go like, oh, they're coming out of a D, each one is coming out of its own D multiplexer. Okay, so two things to check, okay? One is to check the select, okay? Oh, but these are all connected to op, you know, OPSEL or operation select. So we are using the multiplexer here to connect the input to output to over here. And the same thing over here, okay? This input is connected to output one because of the OPSEL operation select is a zero, zero, one. Okay, so what else do we do now? What will be the next question? Now that we know we are looking at the subtractor, the overall borrow of the subtractor is what is becoming the B tunnel. And we also know that the subtractor input, the minuend and the, and the subtrahend, they eventually connect to IN1 and IN2 as input pins of the entire ALU. So what will be the next question or next questions that you're gonna ask? This is from inside the ALU, right? So we have hit, quote unquote, a dead end inside the ALU, but this is not a dead end from the perspective of the processor because these two ports, in one and in two, ultimately connects to something else in the processor. So therefore, the quest continues, right? <clears throat> I suppose I can change the way I explain things into a storytelling session and go like, oh, okay, this character is going out this portal here, that character is going out of that door, where are they coming from, where are they going to, and so on. But I'm not a storyteller kind of person, so that's not my usual way of explaining things. So we click on this, okay, we, we, we confirm that in one connects to the port that we just looked at, and then in two is the same way, okay? So we look at in two, and we can see how it connects to the other port that we just looked at earlier. So now we go like, okay, where did you connect to inside the processor? In other words, we track down this wire and also this wire over here. Well, one thing at a time, okay, we track down in one of the ALU first. It is coming out of a demultiplexer, this one over here. It definitely is enabled because its own enabled port has a bright green, so that means the demultiplexer is in fact in use. Then we track down the select port of the demultiplexer. It says zero one, which means the input connects to output one of the same demultiplexer. So we go like, oh, okay. So we just got confirmation that this port here connects eventually to out zero of the register, the register bank. Then what do we do? Okay, this is a quote-unquote dead end from the perspective of the processor overview. So what do we do? We go into the register bank and say, right now, who is specifying the content of out zero as a port? So we go here, right click, go to view register bank. We track down, you know, output zero, which is this particular port here. Then it is coming out of a multiplexer. We track down the select, which is a zero one, which means input one is connected to the output of this port here. Input one only has one place to go to, which is register B inside the register bank. 
So now we understand that, oh, so the content of register B is the minimum of the subtractor inside the ALU. Okay? And then we do the other one, okay? So this is why you might need to jot down notes because, you know, we are trying to, you know, look into many things at the same time. So if I don't keep, you know, some, keep track of some kind of notes, I can forget about what I still need to track down, okay? So, but I still remember, because I'm the professor of this class, I can still remember these things. So the next one is this one here. And we go like, hmm, this one is coming out of a multiplexer. The multiplexer, this one is a little hard to read, has a dark green as the select. So it's taking input zero as the output of this multiplexer. And input zero of this multiplexer connects to the output one of this D multiplexer. The select of this D multiplexer is indeed a one. So that means the input of this D multiplexer is connected to all the way to into. So we track down the input of this particular D multiplexer and it's coming out of out one of the register bank. Then we do the same thing as last time. We right click on the register bank, go into the register bank and we ask, so who is driving, who's specifying you know, this particular output port? The select says one zero, which is a two. So we look up, this is input zero, this is input one, this is input two. It connects to the output of register C. So now we establish that path from register C, the Q of register C, which is the output of the register C, all the way to in two of the ALU, which then inside the ALU connects to the subtrahend of the subtractor. Okay. And if you're thinking, that's a lot of stuff to track down, the answer is yes, it is, okay? But it is possible, okay? It is just a matter of time, okay? Because once we understand how multiplexers work, how demultiplexers work, how registers work, and so on, it's just a matter of time. It's just like, you know, one of those mazes in a children, you know, magazine, it's like, why would you do that, okay? Why would people buy a 3,000 piece puzzle and try to put everything back together when it's intentionally cut out and scattered all over the place? Why would people do that? You guys are already thinking, it's like, I have no idea and I have no idea why you're teaching this class in this particular way. Why are you giving us a 3,000 piece puzzle to solve? Because by solving the puzzle like this, you now understand how a processor works. That is what you need in order to succeed in the computer architecture class at a four-year university, which then enable you to get jobs you know, after you get your bachelor's degree in computer science or computer engineering. So long trajectory all the way out there, okay? But eventually, it connects to something that I hope you care about. All right, so what do we do now, okay? We are not quite done yet. In fact, we are just a little bit done at this point, okay? So we go back into the ALU, we go like, okay, that explains the B thing, which means, oh, okay, we finally figure out what this thing is. It is the T8 bit of subtracting register C from register B. That is all we know at this point. We go like, so are you talking, are you trying to tell me that there are four more flags like this and we're going to have to spend four X the amount of time that we have spent? No, not even close. Because the other ones are actually easier to figure out. What about the Z flag here, the Z out? The Z out is this guy over here, which is the output of a NOR gate. What are we NORing? Okay, what is NOR? NOR is negated OR, okay? So basically we have a regular OR gate over here, except the bubble says, let's negate the output, okay? So what do you do with the OR gate? What is the one time that the OR gate will give you a zero? I'm not talking about the NOR, I'm talking about regular OR gate. When does the OR gate give you a zero? What, how would you describe the inputs when the OR gate give you a zero? They're all zeros, right? Okay. So because this is a NOR gate, so that means the NOR gate will give you an output of a one if and only if all the inputs are zeros. So where are those inputs coming from? 
Well, they're coming from a, a splitter, but all the splitter does is to connect to the output of this multiplexer. So you track down the multiplexer and go like, where is the, which input of this multiplexer connect to the uh, input ultimately connected to the NOR gate over here? Well, it has the same select as all of the other multiplexers and demultiplexers inside the ALU. So now we track down E001, which is this one here, which by the way, is the difference of the output of the subtractor. This is the actual result of register B minus register C. So we look at the difference or the, whatever the result of the operation is, even though we are not storing that anywhere, we are using it for certain things. We are using the output or the difference of the subtraction to determine whether we got a zero after the subtraction or not. In this case, we did not end up with a zero, so that's why the Z flag or the Z out tunnel is a zero. Okay, so that explains the second flag out of the five. What about the third one? The third one is S out, same thing, we track it down, okay? This one turns out to be quite a bit simpler, okay? Because S out is right here, and it looks like it is just connected to the output of the multiplexer, but that's not the case. There's one little thing between the tunnel S out and the output of this, of this multiplexer. What is that? How do we call that thing, which is right here? What does it look like to you? It's a splitter, very good. Except it doesn't look like a splitter because we only have one single output that we care about. Okay, which output do we care about? I know from your perspective, it may be a little hard to read. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so that you can kind of look at <clears throat> the detail of the splitter. So it is called a splitter. It is splitting, except out of everything that has split apart, only one of the things is important to the splitter. Which one is it? Which bit are we interested in? Seven. Bit seven, very good, okay? So we are talking about bit seven of an eight bit number. What is the significance of the most significant bit of an eight bit number? Sorry, okay, somebody said the right answer. It's the sign, okay? So this goes all the way back to the signed versus unsigned representation discussion, how the sign bit is specifying in this case whether we subtract 128 or not. Okay, because if we do subtract 128, then the, all of the other bits can be ones, we still end up with a negative value. So that means this flag alone will indicate whether the result is negative or not, if we choose to look at the <coughs> result as a signed representation. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so that's, that's, that's not too hard, right? I mean, the, now we have figured out three of the five bits <clears throat> so we continue and look at the fourth one, you know, which is called the O out. So we, we track out O out, okay, click on it. And we see that O out is also here, which is the output of this multiplexer. Same thing, okay, if it's coming out of a multiplexer, track down the select. They all have the same select, okay? All the multiplexers and all the demultiplexers inside the ALU, they have the same select, which is basically connected to OPSEL, your operation select, which is also connected to ALUOP, ALU operation. Okay, so we now track down the input one of this multiplexer, and then we go like, oh, it connects to some kind of ugly circuit using AND and OR gates, okay? So before you get like, you're like ah, what is it? Well, let's try to track down the input to this sub-circuit here, okay, to see if it is something that we can recognize. Track down S1 first, okay? So now we track down S1. S1 is all the way up here, and you can see how, oh, we have seen that before. This is a strange looking splitter. It only cares a bit seven, but this time it is a bit seven of whatever in one is, which is our minuend, which is what we call X in the discussion of binary subtraction. Okay, what about S2? Well, we can see S2 is right here, same deal, okay? It is connected to in2 in this case, which is the subtrahend or y in the binary subtraction. So we are looking at the most significant bits, most significant bits of, guess what? 
This is the most significant bit of what we usually call x in the binary subtraction discussion. This is the most significant bit of y in the binary subtraction discussion. And this is the most significant bit of the difference, or d, in the discussion of binary subtraction. In short, we are talking about d of m minus 1, x of m minus 1, and y of m minus 1, when m specifies the number of bits, the width of the integers. So now you have to try to remember, when was the last time these three bits were mentioned in a context where they kind of work together to get something done? And you remember. It is the, okay, so I'll mention the module first and then we'll talk about the context of that module. The module is binary comparison. Okay, when we talked about binary comparison, that was one context where x of m minus one, bit m minus one of x, bit m minus one of y, and bit m minus one of d, work together to get one thing done. So what is that one thing? Determine whether we got an overflow. That's right, okay? So what we do is, you know, when you're studying, when you're looking at this, you know, I would do this. I would just go to the, the, the notes of binary comparison, which is kind of like all the way back when we talked about um, physical states, gates, and numbers, and then slide all the way down to comparison, okay? So binary number subtraction is after subtraction, after signed versus unsigned, and after two's complement. Here we go, binary comparison. So we look into these notes here, and we go like, okay, so we are looking at something that make use of x of m minus one, y of m minus one, and also d of m minus one. <clears throat> So that turns out to be doo -doo 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 -doo, all the way down here. That is what we're looking at here. So you look at this messy and go like, I don't see how this relates to what I was showing in log and sim. So take a closer look, okay? X of m minus one, that's our S1. Y of m minus one, that's our S2. And then D of m minus one, that's our S out. So what are we doing with these, you know, with these individual bits? We are doing an AND of x7, the negation of y7, the negation of d of 7. That's an AND. Um, what about the other ones? Well, we are also doing another AND over here, but this is the end of the negation of uh, x7, which is s1, the non-negative version of S2, which is Y of M minus one, or Y7 in our case, and also D7, which is S out, non-negative. Then we take a or between those two and. I kind of remember in the circuit, we have two and, and then the output of the ands go to the input of the or. Let's double check. <clears throat> huh, sure enough, we find and, and, and the or, and the bubbles are negations. So we are taking the negation of S1, which is X of M minus one, Y of M minus one, D of M minus one, non-negated, take an and out of all of those things, and then we have another and of X of M, X of M minus one, the negation of Y of M minus one, and the negation of D of M minus one, and then take that end and use that the result of the end as one of the input of the or. And that's why we have the same thing, okay? So I'm hoping all of you can see how this definition of the overflow flag is really the same thing as what this particular subcircuit is doing. It might take some time, okay, to kind of dig it through and understand that what is x m minus one? What is y of m minus one? And what is d of m minus one? And how do they relate to the tunnels of s1, s2, and s out? But that is how we study in this class at this point of time, is to make correlations, you know, is to connect the pieces back to, in this case, something that we talked about a while back. Are we good so far?
Okay, so the bottom line is this wire is really just the O flag of a subtraction. Okay, and currently it is also the O out because of the way we configure the multiplexer. Oh, that explains four out of the five bits already. There's only one more, which is this flag, this output here. Okay, to understand this one, we first have to remember what this what gate is this one. It has the it has the resemblance of an OR, but with something extra. So what is it? Exclusive OR. Very good. So what are we exclusive ORing? What are the two inputs? We are taking S out, which is the same thing as the sine bit of the result of the subtraction, which is P7. We are taking the overflow as the other one. So do you vaguely remember that we use the exclusive OR between those two? in the module that I just showed a little bit earlier. Okay, let's double check that, okay? Let's look at this thing here, okay? The overflow, or the, excuse me, the L flag, less than flag, is the sign flag exclusive or with the O flag, and the sign flag itself is really just another name, an alias, of the most significant bit of the difference, which in our case is known as S out. So we have S out, okay? S is just S out. We have O, which is O out. We take the exclusive OR. That is bit four connected to flags out, okay? So we switch back to the circuit here, and now we can explain, oh, so this is really just the L flag. Are we good so far? So that, now this discussion is particularly important. Because this is telling you how we compare values inside the, the processor. It is a subtraction operation that does not store the difference itself, but instead it would determine the borrow, the Z, which we never really talked about, but it's handy to have. It is not necessary, but it's handy to have. We have the sign of the difference. We have the overflow, which indicates whether the sign of the result makes sense or not. And then we have the L flag, which is the one reliable bit that we can use to determine in a signed comparison is the minimum less than the subtrahend. Okay, so those five pieces of information are all here. So the next question is, what are we doing with this again? You know, what, what started this entire discussion? Well, the question is, what is this output port connected to, okay? That was the context that we talked about earlier. So now we look at that port, okay, S, L, S flags, I mean, flags out. So flags out is right here, it connects to the D port, and we are just about to update the flags register. That was the whole discussion. That was the significance of this entire discussion. So if you look at this thing here, okay, I hope you remember the positioning of the five flags. If you don't, that's okay, because we just talked about it. We do not have a borrow. Does that make sense to you? We have 255 minus one. There's no borrow necessary. If it makes sense to me, the only time you have a borrow is when the subtract hand is larger than the minimum seen from the perspective of unsigned representation. Okay, so no borrow, okay. The result is not a zero. Is that right? I mean, 255 minus one is 254, which is not zero. Okay, the zero being a zero seems to make sense. <clears throat> the sign flag of the result is a one, which means the result is negative. Wait, hold on a second here. Tech, you just said that the result was 254. How is that negative? Well, the same bit pattern, which is one, 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 zero, can be interpreted in a signed way, which means we use the VS definition to interpret the, the bits. So in that case, we have the sign bit being a one, which, mean we, which means we're subtracting 128 from two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64, okay, which is 126. 126 minus 128 is negative two. So the same bit pattern can also represent negative two. Ah, so it makes sense that the sign bit is a one because it is a negative value. 
it's not an overflow. Which basically means if I look at FF as negative one, and we subtract one from negative one, we get negative two. I'm not even looking at the value. We are looking at negative value minus non-negative value, getting a negative value. We're asking, does the sign make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, which means there's no overflow. And that's why overflow is a zero here. And then finally, bit four, the most significant bit over here, is the exclusive or between the sign flag and the overflow flag. So we have one exclusive or with zero being a one. It's all making sense. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this particular setup is, hmm, tech, what if we subtract two values that are exactly the same? What's going to happen? Oh, it's easy to experiment now because the, the processor is frozen in time. The pathways are fully established, but we can still change the values of the registers. So that means I can now go to the register bank, and now we can specify, okay, let's make both of these, you know, zero, one, and see what happens, right? So now we get out of the processor, go back into the ALU, or we just poke the flex out, you know, wire over here, it becomes zero, 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 one, zero. Does that make sense to us? Zero, one, minus zero, one does not need a bond. Makes sense. The result is a zero. It is a zero. There's the sign flag of the result is a zero. Well, what do you think is the sign flag of zero itself? Of course, it's a zero. <clears throat> There's no overflow. We are subtracting a non-negative value from a non-negative value, getting a non-negative value. Seems to make sense to me. No overflow. This is the exclusive or between the sign and the overflow. Well, zero exclusive or with zero is a zero. That makes sense. Okay, one more example. Let's try to make it overflow. Okay, in other words, let's make the sign of the result of the subtraction not make sense. Okay, so now you, what you need to do is to think about what is the most negative value that an A bit number can represent? It's negative 128 because we have the sign bit being a one, everything else being zero. That's as negative as we can go. So if we subtract one from one, negative 128, that should overflow, right? Because that should just bump it over to go like, oh, this is, this is beyond the most negative value that I can represent since you only gave me eight bits, okay? So let's do that. So we go to the register bank and we specify the most negative value to begin with, which is in the representation of eight zero. Because, it is, because bit seven is the only one being a one, everything else are zeros in this case. So that becomes eight zero in hexadecimal. And we are still subtracting one from it because that would just bump it over to something that we cannot represent anymore. So now we go back to the main processor. We poke the wire coming out of the ALU. We poke your flex out again. And then we try to explain all of these bits all over again. <clears throat> the borrow flag is a zero. Why? Because we are subtracting one from 128. Because the borrow flag only makes sense when you look at things from the unsigned perspective. Okay? All right? Makes sense. The result is non-zero. Okay? Because you know, the bit pattern of the subtraction is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. No matter which way you look at it, it is not zero. Okay? So the zero flag is a zero, meaning the result is non-zero. Makes sense. The sign flag is a zero because when you look at 7F, 0111111, the most significant bit is indeed a zero. Okay? So the sign flag is a zero. But do we have an overflow? The answer is yes, we have an overflow because we just subtracted a non-negative value from a negative value the result should be negative, but it's not. So the sign of the result or the sign of the difference does not make sense. That is how we determine whether we have an overflow or not. So the overflow flag being a one, yeah, that makes sense. So remember the purpose of the overflow flag? The sign flag says whether the minuend is less than the subtrahend in signed interpretation 
it also throws flag set whether the sign flag is lying or not. So in this case, the sign flag says no, the minimum end is not less than the subtract hand. The overflow flag said, oh, don't trust the sign flag, the sign flag is lying. So the, what does that mean? It means that the minimum end, which is negative 128, is indeed less than <coughs> the subtract hand, which is one in this case. All five you know, bits are making sense. All right, so this is really pivotal in this class because what this allow us to do is we now have the means to implement comparison. Something as simple as comparison is actually the key to every condition, almost every condition in the C or C++ program. If you think about it, that's what it boils down to. All conditions, all the, for all the loops, all the conditional statements, every single one of those eventually boil down to some kind of comparison. So this is really pivotal because not only did we just talk about comparison, we also talked about conditional brand, which means, oh, we can do something differently depending on whether it is a less than, whether it is equal to. So that allow us to also make decision, you know, which means you know, the control structure thing, can now be implemented. Now we haven't, we have not, we did not talk about control structures in this class, but these are the building blocks of control structures. So we are about five or four minutes from the end of the lecture. I'm gonna take a roll anyway, <clears throat> now that everybody is here. So we're gonna do it, okay? So today's roll taking activity is not visible to you just yet. I'm gonna make it visible. So it is now visible, and you have, uh, I guess you have three minutes to do it. I think that's enough time. The access code is conditional in all lower case. Yeah, we still have like two minutes and a half. If needed, I can make it a little bit you know, longer. So conditional, or condition, is the access key to the role taking activity. <clears throat> Oh, conditional, that's right, okay. <laughs> You're correct, it is conditional. <clears throat> Not that anyone in the class here really care about. There's a reason why I take role, well, a few reasons. One is I really want to keep track of who's you know in person in class because you know people who have been missing classes like twice or three times, especially in a row for no particular reason, that's a flag that those people may not be doing well in class. Okay, now if it's a it's a correlation. I'm not saying one thing lead to the other one or the other way around, but it's a correlation, which basically means you know I really need to have a conversation if somebody has not been in, you know, attending the class in session, in person, for no reason. If that's a medical reason, hey, you know, I, I get it, I understand, not a problem. And then the other thing is, you know, um, you know for the, it's, it's a data point, okay, because I want to collect you know, some data points as to how many missed classes would correlate with what kind of performance you know, in this class. So that's the other reason why I keep you know, taking role. All right, so does anyone have any problem getting into the role taking activity and getting through it? No, okay, all right. <clears throat> so one, so now we are transitioning to today's lab. So today's lab is a little bit interesting, okay? <clears throat> it involves tracking down the path of execution. So if I scroll all the way to today's, this is today's your lab. And the access code is, I think it's J O Y Joy. Okay, so here we go. J O Y. There we go. All right. But I do want to talk about the lab a little bit. Okay. There's one portion of the lab that wants you to analyze the execution of a program and count the number of times a specific instruction executes. So that's the objective. So the question is, how do you do it? 
So I'm going to go back to Logisim here. Okay, so for this particular lab, you can use this technique. Is you can go to Logisim, go to logging, and then you can specify what is going to trigger an entry in the log. So whatever you drag or you add from the left hand side to the right hand side is something that the log mechanism is sensitive to. I won't give you the right one, okay, but I'm just going to give you something here. So let's just say that register A is seems to be important, okay, which is which is not the case for your lab. I'm just saying that if it is important. So what you do is you say add. So now we have register A being watched, okay, being monitored. <clears throat> when it is logged, you can log it in different bases. It is by uh, default in base two. Base two is not a very friendly base to us. So I would suggest base 16 just because the assembler log, you know, also give you the output of optos and whatnot in hexadecimal, which is base 16. So I would do it in base 16. So what I have done so far is to say, Whenever register A is changed, just keep a log entry. Okay, you know, just you know, update the log. You know, whenever register A is changed, so you kind of have to think about which register is important to track when you're interested in where you know, how many times an opcode at a specific location executes. Okay, so you kind of have to think about that. Remember, I said earlier, way earlier in today's lecture that blah, 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 blah is going to be important for the lab. So now the question is, do you recall what that was? Okay? That's another reason why taking notes may be important in class. Okay? Because when I mentioned that, that should have triggered you guys to be like, I better jot this down because you know, the professor said this is going to be important in today's lab. <clears throat> okay? All right. So, but there are two ways to do this. One way to do this is to use a table. The other way to do this is to use a file. I personally would use a file, okay, just because you can open up Notepad or whatever favorite editor that is installed on your computer, then you can kind of go back and forth to look for something, okay? So personally, I would use a file. So the way you use a file is not to click enable, this is not clickable. Instead, you go to select, and then you just specify the path to a specific file. Now, this is just for me, so it won't work on your PC. It will work on Mac OS, I think, but it won't work on the PC. So I'm just going to say uh, test.log, okay? You can name the file any way you want. It's just a regular text file. So on a Windows machine, I would probably put a TXT extension to it. So what that means is from now on, when I run this program and I make any changes to the to register A, it will make an entry in that particular file, okay? But in your homework assignment, or not a homework, in your lab, you are supposed to track down, you know, the execution of five slightly different programs, and for each one, you have to count the number of times a specific opcode executes. So that means you have to kind of track this like five times. So now this is becoming important. If you don't do anything and you just run the different programs, you know, you know, individually, it will everything go to the same file. In other words, the default is to append new entries to an existing file, which is not what you want, okay? Because you're supposed to count the number of times that, op, that an opcode executes for each program. So the way to quote unquote reset the file is this. You go to this interface again, you go to select, and you're gonna select the same file, okay? That's all you do, you do select the same file, but if that file has content in it, Logistim will ask you, do you want to overwrite or do you want to append to the file that already exists? You specify overwrite. So that's how you can reset the log for each program that you're supposed to enter. Is that okay? All right, so I think that should address all the potential questions that you might have for this lab. Any questions from you guys before I turn off the recorder and upload the recording? I'm not seeing any questions.
Okay, all right. So I'm gonna turn off the recorder <clears throat> and then upload it, and then I'll go out get you know some water to drink, and then I'll be back to answer your questions. All right. <clears throat>